Good morning and a warm welcome to everyone present today on behalf of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Um, this hearing is part of the 149th regular session of the Commission and in this particular hearing we will be considering and receiving information on freedom of expression and communication surveillance by the United States. Um, I'm pleased to let you know that I'm joined um, by my fellow commissioners and the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, Commissioner Escobar, Rodrigo Escobar Hill is here as well as Commissioner Felipe Gonzalez and Commissioner Ros Rosemary Antoine and the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, Catalina Botera. Uh, we, the hearing today is requested by the American Civil Liberties Foundation, the ACLU, and we are very pleased to welcome the UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and the Protection of the Right to Freedom of Opinion and Expression, um, who is well known to us at the Commission, Frank LaRue. Welcome. We also um, are grateful to have the presence of the United States and its representatives, the Deputy Permanent Representative, uh, Lawrence Gombina, and his team. Um, I wish to hand over first to the petitioners and to those who will provide us with information. Um, the purpose of this hearing is to ensure that the Commission has relevant information about the nature and scope of communication surveillance technologies and techniques that have been developed and practiced by the United States National Security Agency and to help the Commission to understand the implications of that type of surveillance in the area of human rights. Madam Commissioner, uh, Honorable Commissioners, representatives of the Government of the United States. Uh, my name is Stephen Watt. I am a senior staff attorney with the Human Rights Program of the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, the ACLU requested today's hearing following media reports from the United States um, that the US National Security Agency is conducting surveillance of hundreds of millions of people around the world. The government has sought to justify this mass surveillance on national security grounds, yet official reports indicate that the NSA has conducted surveillance of the communi communications of world leaders, of allied foreign powers, UN and EU offices, foreign corporations, and countless numbers of innocent Americans and foreign nationals. The NSA's dragnet surveillance programs have understandably been the subject of great public concern both here in the United States and internationally. The international community led by the United Nations has begun the process of assessing NSA type mass surveillance programs in the light of relevant human rights laws and standards. At today's hearing we will provide the Commission with information necessary for the Commission to start this process at the regional human rights level. And with me on the panel today is speaking first, Mr. Frank LaRue, the current UN Special Rapporteur on the right to expression and the author of two recent and groundbreaking reports on the internet and surveillance in the digital age. Uh, Mr. LaRue will address the human rights framework that should ground state surveillance programs. Alex Abdo is a senior staff attorney with the American Civil Liberties Union. Um, he works with the National Security Project and has been involved in litigation of NSA surveillance programs in U.S. courts. Um, Mr. Abdo will provide information on the NSA surveillance programs and their impacts on the rights of both U.S. and non-U.S. citizens. And finally, without the courage of Edward Snowden, a former contractor with the NSA, leaking documents on NSA surveillance practices to the media, the vigorous public debate that is now taking place on the legality of these programs uh, would, not, would not exist. Um, and this is a debate that President Obama himself has welcomed. So Emmy McLean of Open Society uh, Justice Initiative uh, will address the related issue of human rights protections for whistleblowers like Edward Snowden who work in the national security sector. Thank you, Mr. LaRue. Thank you very much. Quisiera agradecer. 
I'd like to firstly thank the members of the Commission for this opportunity and say that it is a pleasure both as the UN Rapporteur as well as a previous user and petitioner in the Inter-American Human Rights Protection Safety and a, a friend of, of this system that I'm appearing before right now. A couple of things. One is that I'm relating two of my recent reports and the report on surveillance, state surveillance of communication, privacy, and freedom of expression was prior to the Snowden disclosures. So it's very important to say that I drafted this report not in relationship with one incident or one country, but it was a report drafted with the idea of establishing global principles around the world for all countries at all time. Um, I was very conscious, and I say it in my report, that I'm linking two different rights, the right to privacy with the right to freedom of expression. They're very distinct rights with the different articles that, that norm it and, and different forms of protection, but that are in, intrinsically linked because freedom of expression cannot be exercised if privacy is not respected. And privacy, the right to privacy guarantees the sense of freedom and creativity and especially the freedom of expressing opinions that everyone May, must need to be able to feel safe in exercising this right. Secondly, I say in my report that I'm not denying the fact that we are living in a particular world today where violence and terrorism, and in some countries like in Latin America, organized crime is a real threat. I'm not denying the threat. I'm not challenging the questions, the obligations of national security that every state has. I believe that all states not only uh, must put a major effort but have an obligation to guarantee security to all of its citizens and all people in their territory. But having said that, what I say in my report is that national security has, be, has to be understood as something that protects individuals, but it also protects democratic institutions and it protects democracy as a whole, which is the challenges we're suffering. So we cannot put in mechanisms issues or, mecha or, or procedures or surveillance techniques that supposedly guarantee the security of individuals against acts of terror or violence, but harm our democratic institutions and harm the democratic principles that lead any country in the world. This is a contradiction which we cannot live with because ultimately it will come and haunt us. So all mechanisms of protection have to be done within the framework of law in a democratic system. So there has to be a due process of law procedure to establish these mechanisms. Surveillance is not new. It happened with written letters. It happened with telephone calls. But it was always related to the investigation authorized by a judge and was always related to some degree of, of, of vigilance by parliamentary special commissions. And I believe, and I say in my report, that it's important for the sake of protecting uh, rights that most states have the double system, the system of judiciary oversight and parliamentary vigilance on these mechanisms within a specific procedure. What is not permissible from a human rights point of view is that those that hold political power or those that are in security agencies or even less those that work in intelligence agencies decide by themselves, for themselves, what is going to be the scope of breaching the right to privacy? And who will they target, or maybe not even target, who will they blanket surveil? And this is the problem we're finding in the world, because if we allow this to happen in any of the cases, with any justification, it will inevitably become an abusive system where power will be imposed on people and opinions of dissent or criticism will be stifled. And, 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 and therefore, this breach of privacy will inevitably, in any country, become a form of censorship. And this is what's unacceptable. There has to be a legal procedure in place for it to happen, and there has to be transparency. The parliament has to monitor, parliament, congress, whatever it's called in every country, or the society has to know, where, and, and those that have suffered surveillance have to be notified of the fact that this has happened. Of course, Today the scandal is because many heads of state of foreign countries have suffered this. But we believe this is a very sensitive issue because of diplomatic relations, but it, it is equally important when common citizens 
are suffering a breach of their privacy as well. Because in this case, the surprise was the massiveness of the phenomenon. And in this massiveness of surveillance, it is the massiveness of the fear it provokes for exercising freedom of expression and freedom of thought. Finally, on my second report, uh, this report, by the way, I presented in the 3rd of June. I will give the commission a copy, Madam Chairperson, um, and, and I will um, gladly share all, all my opinions, some of which I have also shared and worked together with the special rapporteur of this commission, with Ms. Catalina Botero. I have also worked uh, my latest report, which was presented on Friday, on the 25th of October, on access to public information and the right to truth. The right to truth is something very well known in this commission, but traditionally linked to Articles 1, 8, and 25 of the American Convention. What I was trying to do it is to close the circle and say the right to truth is linked to 1, 8, 25, and 13, because any information related to human rights violations, which is called the right to truth, the right to truth of human rights violations, should also be a privileged sector of the access to information. When we talk about access to information, we're talking normally about transparency on finances, but I believe that this transparency goes to political decisions as well, how political decisions are made, how policies are established, and the possibility of any citizen to know how the decision-making process of those in public office happens. And the logic of this is those that hold public office hold the authority in the name of the people and seeking the common good. So there is no reason for secrecy except for some very, very small cases. Here I say that also in access to the information related to human rights violations, there should be less of an exception limit. And we have been working with a series of organizations in the Schwanne principles uh, on, on access to information related to human rights violations. We establish, I think, a legitimate framework of what could be considered in a very minimal way the legitimate limitations. I would certainly encourage this commission to um, have a revision of these principles and, and I am actually encouraging all regional bodies to adopt the principles to make them uh, universal in some way as I presented them to the General Assembly this past week. And finally, the last word on, on whistleblowers. If access to information related to human rights violation is known as the right to truth, and the right to truth is a privileged right, not only of those that are victims and their relatives, as it was in the, in, in the past, but now of everyone in society, because it's very relevant for a democracy to see why human right violations occur. Therefore, the release of information regarding human rights violations should carry no liability with it. It is important to say that anyone, any, not only journalist, but any individual who possesses or receives information regarding human rights violation can use it to denounce those violations, regardless of where it was obtained for, from and how. I think this is a very important principle, a difficult one to, to understand, but this is in, we, we must prioritize the defense of human rights over everything else. And unless there is a breach of security for individuals and, and, and put the in danger, in serious danger individuals, the access to information related to human rights violations should be a priority for the state, but also for all society, and therefore there should be a protection for whistleblowers in this regard. These are the principles I established in my two reports, which I would gladly share. I have um, been uh, visiting uh, Brazil recently, and there is a World Forum on Human Rights where I have been asked to develop this further uh, in, in December, and it would be very important to have the accompaniment of, of this commission and especially of the Special Rapporteur uh, for Freedom of Expression, who has also been invited uh, by the government of Brazil to, to participate in this event. Thank you very much. Distinguished Commissioners and Representatives of the United States, on behalf of the ACLU, I would like to thank the Commission for holding this timely hearing and for the opportunity to testify before it. Over the last four months, it has become clear that the NSA is engaged in far-reaching and intrusive surveillance of the communications of Americans and non-Americans alike. Under Section 215 of the Patriot Act, the NSA is tracking every single phone call made by a resident of the United States, whom they called, when they called them, and for how long they spoke. 
Until recently, it was tracking ordinary Americans' internet activity as well. Under Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, called the FISA Amendments Act, the NSA is conducting sweeping surveillance, both of Americans' international communications and of foreigners' communications. In our written testimony, we explained the surveillance programs operating under these two statutes. This morning, however, I would like to focus on the FISA Amendments Act, because I believe that the scope of surveillance that the NSA has instituted under that statute uh, poses a unique threat to international privacy and expression. Under the FISA Amendments Act, the NSA is authorized to engage in dragnet surveillance of international communications when two conditions are satisfied. First, the targets of the NSA's surveillance must be foreigners. Second, the purpose of the NSA's surveillance must be to gather foreign intelligence. Neither of these restrictions has any bite. Although the NSA must target its surveillance efforts, it is authorized to monitor international communications about its targets. The NSA has interpreted this authority to allow it to scan the contents of any international communication for keywords related to its targets. In practice, the NSA appears to implement this interpretation of its authority by creating a copy of an enormous quantity of international communications that transit major telecommunications switches, scanning them for specific keywords, and then segregating for longer-term storage those that match its search. Additionally, the phrase foreign intelligence, which is the second condition, is defined extraordinarily broadly to include information related to the United States' foreign affairs. Therefore, the NSA surveillance is not limited to the investigation of suspected terrorists or criminals, but it includes the gathering of information about anything relevant to American interests abroad. That lax requirement is implemented even more laxly. Based on documents leaked by Edward Snowden, we now know that the NSA considers the fact that a foreigner is a party to a communication to be evidence that the communication itself contains foreign intelligence and is therefore targetable. The effect of the NSA's broad understanding of its surveillance authority under the FISA Amendments Act is simply this, to make virtually every international communication fair game for surveillance by the NSA. Under the FISA Amendments Act, the NSA could monitor foreign journalists to discover their sources or to learn about their country's politics. It could target foreign human rights defenders to determine what they know about the United States' involvement in abusive interrogation or in foreign drone strikes. And it could target foreign dissidents who are challenging the authority of regimes allied with the United States. Under the FISA Amendments Act, the NSA could even target foreign corporations to protect America's international economic interests. It could target the foreign lawyers who represent Guantanamo Bay detainees to see how much they've learned of their clients' mistreatment. And it could target the foreign members of this commission while they are abroad to find out, for example, those members' views of the recent controversy surrounding the NSA's surveillance practices. Recent news stories have confirmed that the NSA's surveillance is, in fact, this broad in practice. Two separate programs, known as PRISM and Upstream, collect the content of electronic communications in which at least one party is believed to be a non-U.S. person. Documents have confirmed that at least 29 foreign nations have been subjected to surveillance by the NSA. Recently, the media reported that the NSA collects and stores data from approximately half a billion German communications each month. Le Monde reported that over a one-month period, the NSA collected 70 million records of French citizens' telephone data. And just this morning, El Mundo reported that also in a one-month period, the NSA collected information on more than 60 million calls in Spain. The NSA has also engaged in targeted surveillance of friendly foreign governments, including members of the Organization of American States. Reports recently surfaced that the U.S. had monitored the phone calls of the President of Brazil and the communications of Petrobras, Brazil's state oil corporation. And just last week, Der Spiegel revealed that the NSA had hacked email accounts of former President of Mexico, Felipe Calderón, and his cabinet. Reports also indicate that the NSA has bugged the headquarters of the United Nations and the European Union. The NSA's sweeping view of its authority to monitor international communications should be of particular concern to this commission. We now live in an age in which digital communications not only enhance our expressive and associational freedoms, but has become central to them. 
Our ability to trust the relative security of those communications, however, has been deeply eroded by the astonishing breadth of the NSA surveillance. Simply put, if every country were to engage in surveillance as unfettered as the NSA, we would soon live in a world of pervasive monitoring. And if every country were to embrace as seemingly lenient a policy on the sharing of surveillance with other countries, there would be no refuge for the world's dissidents, journalists, and human rights defenders. It is our hope that the Commission will help forestall these possibilities by recommending that in conducting surveillance, the United States respect and ensure the rights to freedom and expression and privacy long established in international law. Thank you again for the invitation to testify. Distinguished Commissioners, uh, Special Rapporteur, and Representatives of the United States, I'd like to express my appreciation, as my colleagues have, for your holding this important hearing and for the opportunity to be here today. My statement today and the more expansive written submission that accompanies it are limited to three areas. The public right to information, and especially information of high public interest, including where it relates to national security. The state obligation to protect from sanction those who possess or disclose information in the public interest, and more generally, to limit sanctions on unauthorized disclosures. And the lack of appropriate protection in the United States for public interest disclosures in the security sector. As has been discussed here today already and widely reported around the world, unauthorized disclosures by former NSA contractor Edward Snowden in recent months have unearthed massive and previously little known US state surveillance programs. Much needs to be analyzed regarding the consistency uh, or lack thereof of US surveillance practices with domestic and international law. And I'm grateful that this commission is seized of the matter. However, as Mr. Watt said in his introduction, this case also compels consideration of the treatment of the person who provoked this debate and others like him. International law permits legitimate restrictions of freedom of expression and the public's right to know on national security grounds. Yet these restrictions must be well-grounded, narrow, and strictly interpreted consistent with the principle of maximum disclosure. Further, information related to national security is not exempt from public access for that reason alone. Indeed, the importance of public access to government information concerning the security sector is of particular importance because of the discretion typically afforded the executive in this area, the state's great powers, including to wage war and conduct counterterrorism operations, and its oversight of significant public funds. Here, undue deference to arguments concerning national security secrecy can and have contributed to human rights violations, corruption, waste and abuses, with accountability hampered by secrecy. As U.S. Supreme Court Justice Poster, Potter Stewart wrote in the Pentagon Papers case, the only effective restraint upon executive policy and power in the areas of national defense and international affairs may lie in an enlightened citizenry. Within a system of universally acknowledged overclassification, the elimination of unauthorized disclosures in the public interest, or leaks, would effectively eviscerate the public's ability to monitor government actions related to defense and national security. Yet, in a dramatic shift from the past, the United States is aggressively pursuing leakers as spies and undermining media freedom in the process, regardless of any relevant public interest considerations. Relevant U.S. law governing sanctions for the unauthorized possession or disclosure of classified information or information otherwise related to national security is largely but not exclusively found in the 1917 Espionage Act. The Espionage Act was enacted in, in the World War I era to punish spies who disclosed protected information to a foreign enemy, but it has been used more broadly to punish disclosures to the public without any intent to disclose to a foreign enemy. In strikingly broad language, it provides for 10 years imprisonment for each count of unauthorized possession or disclosure of classified or national defense information or for the conspiracy to do so. Most provisions sanctioning the unauthorized possession or disclosure of defense or security related information within the Espionage Act and related laws are universally applicable to both public servants with security clearance and private persons, though in only one instance has the government indicted private persons under the Espionage Act for leaks. 
The United States has a whistleblower protection regime, but its availability is virtually non-existent for security sector personnel. A presidential policy directive issued in October 2012 purports to support security sector reporting of waste, fraud, and abuse in recognition of the limitations of existing regulations. Yet it too is lacking. It does not apply to contractors or members of the armed forces, does not provide for any legal mechanism to redress retaliation, creates an administrative review mechanism which is purely discretionary, and does not even make the determination and proposed remedy of the administrative review mechanism binding on the intelligence agency. U.S. law concerning the prosecution of leaks and protections of whistleblowers does not comply with international legal standards related to freedom of expression information for several fundamental reasons. The offenses are vague and overbroad and lack requisite intent and harm requirements, nor has the executive or the courts read such requirements into the statutes. The offenses and penalties also do not sufficiently take into account the public interest in disclosure of certain information or provide adequate whistleblower protections for security sector personnel. Moreover, for most offenses, the law does not distinguish between public servants on the one hand and the media and the public on the other in terms of applicable offenses or penalties. Further, U.S. law criminalizes conspiracy to commit offense at the same level as the actual offense, without sufficient protections for journalists or public watchdogs. Indeed, in recent years, the government has increasingly threatened the prosecution of journalists and watchdogs for conspiracy. Finally, the penalties for unauthorized possession and disclosure under U.S. law are disproportionately severe, with chilling effects. The breathtaking expansiveness of the Espionage Act has benefited, benefited historically from executive discretion limiting leak prosecutions. In the more than 60 years between World War, Ton, World War II and the beginning of the Obama administration, there were only three Espionage Act indictments related to disclosures to the media. This has changed radically under the current administration. Over the less than five years in which Barack Obama has been president, the U.S. government has issued eight indictments in relation to leaks to the media, relying on the Espionage Act. These include indictments for disclosures which have revealed human rights violations, war crimes, fraud and waste, and other information of public interest. Further, those who have received or were suspected of receiving leaks, including journalists, have in some instances been subject to targeted surveillance, threatened with prosecution or alleged to be co-conspirators in the crime, ordered to disclose or testify against their sources, or penalized for the refusal to do so. While no journalist has thus far been prosecuted under the Espionage Act, the aggressive enforcement of unauthorized disclosures in recent years suggests that may be a real threat. As one New York Times journalist described, the crackdown had its intended effect, both prosecuting the underlying cases and scaring others into not talking. Another veteran national security journalist said, chilling isn't quite strong enough. It's more like freezing the whole process into a standstill. So in addition to laying out the concerns with the U.S. law, I'd like to briefly uh, acknowledge also the set of global principles on national security and right to information, information that Mr. LaRue mentioned, which were released earlier this year, and as Mr. LaRue did, urge the com commission to consider endorsing them. Based on international and national law and standards, they provide guidance crucial, crucial to these discussions, setting out detailed guidelines on the appropriate limits of secrecy, including the role of and protection for whistleblowers, limitations on sanctions for national security leaks, and information related to state surveillance for which there should be presumptive disclosure. These principles were elaborated in collaboration with relevant special mandate holders, including my distinguished co-panelist, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of the Right to Freedom of Opinion and Expression, and this commission's distinguished special rapporteur for freedom of expression. They have been endorsed by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, and we are also currently engaged with the special rapporteur on freedom of expression and access to information of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights to seek endorsement of the principles within the African system as well. Um, I can speak more about the specific principles, perhaps, in the discussion, if there's not sufficient time now. I'm, is, I'm not sure how we are on time. Or I can, can say you, a few I words. I give you a minute or two. Okay. So relevant to the theme of this hearing, I would just like to highlight a few specific principles. 
Under Principles 4 and 9, governments may legitimately withhold information in narrowly defined areas, such as defense plans and the operations and sources used by intelligence services. However, in each instance, the government bears the burden of proof to demonstrate the necessity of restrictions on the right to public information. Pursuant to Principle 10A, governments should never withhold information on violations of international human rights and humanitarian law, including information about the circumstances and perpetrators of torture and crimes against humanity, the location of secret prisons, or information about past abuses of international human rights or humanitarian law under previous regimes. Under Principle 30, governments may not keep information confidential that prevents victims of human rights violations from seeking or obtaining a remedy. Under Principles 10C and 10E, the public has a right to know about the existence of all security sector entities and their budgets, as well as systems of surveillance, the legal framework governing them, and the procedures for authorizing surveillance and using, sharing, storing, and destroying intercepted material. Under Principles 40, 41, and 43, whistleblowers in the public sector should not face retaliation if the public information disclosed outweighs the public interest in secrecy. But where an effective mechanism exists, they should first make a reasonable effort to address the issue through official complaint mechanisms. Under Principles 43 and 46, criminal action against those who leak information should be considered only if the information poses a real and identifiable risk of causing significant harm that overrides the public interest in disclosure, and if the law clearly sets forth narrow categories of information whose disclosure poses a high likelihood of causing harm. And finally, principles 47 and 48, the media and others who are not public servants should not be sanctioned for receiving, possessing, or disclosing classified information to the public, or for conspiracy or other crimes based on their seeking or accessing classified information. Placing the onus on the state to keep confidential information secret strikes a proper balance between the needs of legitimate secrecy and the high public interest in robust watchdogs and the disclosure of certain information, critical for, for public oversight. The media and other private persons should also not be forced to reveal a confidential source or other published information in a leak investigation. Uh, in, in closing, the Commission's endorsement of these principles would be important for considerations of U.S. law and practice, but also for other countries in the region grappling with questions related to the appropriate limits on national security secrecy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, can I turn to the United States and your representatives to offer your observations? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, distinguished Commissioners, Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, uh, Executive Secretary, uh, Petitioners, and Secretariat colleagues. My name is Lawrence Gumbiner. I am the Deputy Permanent Representative of the United States Mission to the Organization of American States. I am joined here at the table by Ms. Rachel Owen, also of our U.S. Mission to the OAS, Ms. Margaret Pickering of the State Department's legal staff, and Mr. Andrew Stevenson. Uh, of the U.S. Mission to Organization of American States. It is a pleasure for all of us to be here today. I would like to begin by reaffirming that the United States takes the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and its role in the OAS very seriously and is committed to addressing with you human rights issues in the hemisphere, including in the United States. We have worked steadfastly in recent years to increase our engagement with the Commission on important human rights issues facing our country. We have actively participated in Commission meetings, hearings, and expert consultations. We are dedicated to this process and make every effort to ensure the appropriate level of participation to provide the Commission with the opportunity to engage with a full array of policymakers and decision makers in the U.S. government. We take pride in the Commission's role in our region and are open to engagement, and we welcome the hearings today on this particular topic of concern to NGOs, civil society, and the public. However, events in the last month have prevented the United States from preparing sufficiently in order to engage as fully as we would like for today's hearing. Consistent with the Commission's rules providing for no less than 30 days notice of hearings, the United States received four notices for hearings on the evening of Friday, September 27 which 
each included voluminous statements and submissions by interested private persons. Just a few days later, on October 1, most of the United States federal government shut down and did not reopen until October 17. This extraordinary event, something that has not happened in the United States for 17 years and never during the period immediately prior to a commission session, prevented the United States from undertaking full and adequate preparations for the hearings today. With the government closed and most of its employees furloughed, we lost the time essential for us to engage our interagency colleagues and prepare for these hearings. In particular, many of the specific government agencies with expertise in the matters to be raised today did not have staff on the job to consider the Commission's communications and assist in preparations. It was for these reasons that on October 8, and again on October 18, the United States sent separate letters to the Commission requesting a postponement of all U.S. hearings and working meetings until the February 2014 sessions. Please be aware that we made these requests after much consultation and with the understanding that petitioners, NGOs, and the public deserve robust participation from the United States, something we knew would not be possible with such a limited amount of time. The experts from throughout our government who returned to work after more than two weeks of furlough were not able at this late stage to identify witnesses, prepare testimony, gather documentation, and do the work necessary to fully respond to the issues before us. Given the sensitive and important nature of the matters before the Commission, and because the United States takes its engagement with the Commission seriously, it typically takes us the entire 30-day period for my government to prepare fully researched and coordinated responses. The bottom line is that unfortunately today we are not in the position to address the issues raised in your petition. We are here to carefully listen to what the petitioners and witnesses have to say and to take on board any questions or comments from the Commission. However, since we will not be in a position to provide responses today, we do propose and commit to follow up in writing in the next 30 days on all of these matters. We would welcome an opportunity to appear and discuss these issues at a further and future hearing before the Commission. We would like to thank you for raising the issues and assure you that we will follow up in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Permanent Representative. Um, I'm also joined by Executive Secretary Emilio Alvarez de Casa. And as I mentioned in the last year, in the Commission received and had due regard to the request from the United States to postpone this and other hearings, which involved the United States. Um, the Commission considered that the importance of the issues um, we, we ought to go ahead, and we also had regard to the interests and wishes of the petitioners, and we welcome the opportunity um, which the state will afford us to, in writing, um, give a full response. And I'll also reiterate, as I offered in the last commission, in the, in the last hearing, that the commission receives requests from states um, for hearings on human rights issues, and we welcome requests from the United States um, as well in relation to any of the matters which are the subject of hearings. I wish to offer the floor first to the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, Catalina Botera, um, to offer her comments and questions for the state. Gracias, Presidenta. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to thank the petitioners, especially for this important hearing, and of course the representatives from the U.S. government for being here today and for your offer to submit answers in writing in the within the next 30 days. As the U.S. government knows, the rapporteurship is highly concerned due to the extent of the surveillance issues that have been that have come to light. We have said so on several occasions, and we have publicly expressed this 
through the joint press releases with the UN Rapporteur. I would like to reiterate some specific concerns, three specifically, and I would like to know whether we can receive more information from the petitioners as well as the U.S. government in your response. The first one has to see, has to do with controls in order to ensure higher transparency and control and on some surveillance programs. So much so uh, that you can while protecting national security, you can also protect privacy, labor, uh, freedom of expression, not only of our U.S. persons, but foreign as well. The government said that it will create a group of experts in order to review the way in which these surveillance programs work, the ones that have been uh, reported about today. I would like to know what you have done in this regard and what kind of proposals you have to amend these foreign surveillance programs. One of the big issues that have been uh, brought here is the lack of sufficient and adequate information by the court to have independent and sufficient uh, support. So I would like to know what kind of, of, of mechanisms have been in place in terms of FISA. In terms of the press, there's been a reform on the guidelines to collect metadata, especially in terms of press agencies, journalists, and the media. I would like to know what those guidelines are all about to control this uh, metadata collection process. Another thing that I think is important is what's related to the protection of communications, privacy, and freedom of expression of foreign nationals in their communication through companies, through U.S. companies. I would like to know whether this expert task force and these proposed amendments that are being discussed bear in mind the need to protect the human rights, which are universal, of all individuals, especially foreign nationals that go, communicate through U.S. companies. The third issue has to do with access to information and informants. Well, we have talked about the principles that the rapporteurship has worked under. We have worked on those principles. We support them. And that is why it is a concern for us to see uh, this, the, the criteria that are being used to define what kind of information must be preserved, and more specifically, the protection of sources or informants. I would like to know what kind of guarantees the U.S. affords to people, more specifically public officials, that disclose confidential information, which is a violation itself, but is of high public interest, especially when it has to do with violation of human rights. What kind of guarantees do those persons have not to be prosecuted and to not apply the Espionage Act, and more specifically, to not apply the type of aid to the enemy principle, which for the rapporteurship is a particularly dangerous principle. So these are the issues that I would like to address, and we can have a specific letter with all the details to the state later on. But if you have any comments, I would very much appreciate it if you share it with us. Commissioner Antoine, any questions? Thank you. I'd like to thank the petitioners and the representatives of the state for their presentations. The first thing I want to say here at the Inter-American Commission, we receive cases that are usually in which there's a conflict between freedom of expression and private freedom and right to privacy, uh, particularly uh, one private citizen vis-a-vis -vis another one or a private citizen vis-a-vis -vis public authorities. But based on the information that has been coming in here to the Commission that has been gathered by the Commission prior to this hearing, it would seem that what this is about is a, situ is a situation when both the right to privacy as well as the right to freedom of expression may be infringed. And so, therefore, what has been stated here as the rapporteur, Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression of the Commission has just mentioned, and it's very important. It, because 
we must move towards putting into place a mechanism that assuming the legitimacy of the of the security function of the state are not uh, intrusive on the rights of individuals so the united states has a long tradition in its legal precedent constitutionally we say that with state agencies are supposed to use the least intrusive mes methods least intrusive means in gathering information they should be as unintrusive as possible and with regard to freedom of expression, et cetera, and other, and freedom of privacy. And with regard to the, uh, the, with regard to the check and balances mechanism that must properly function, we also have to realize that we have statements a few days ago from a judge who is in charge of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act Court who said, Often the government surveillance breaks the court's rules that aim to protect Americans' privacy. Without taking drastic steps, it, can, it also cannot check the veracity of the government's assertions that the violations its staff members report are intentional mistakes. The, pro the, problem, is que con the problem is is that with a, with a pr program of this scope, it's obvious that any form of control becomes illusory when there's hundreds of millions of communications that are being monitored and surveilled. And thus, it's there must be a, a, these investigations have to be limited and there must be controls must be put into place by independent organs of the state and, and or bodies of the state. And thank you. That's all I wanted to say. I want to begin by thanking the petitioners for their participation and also state how pleased I am that the special UN Rapporteur for Freedom of Thought and Expression has taken part for the freedom of opinion and expression for the important information he has provided and I would like to thank the state for its participation. But I once again would like to restate the frustration of the commission and the frustration felt by the commissioners and of civil society as well and of the entire international community that is watching and listening or listening to this hearing live for the lack of information provided by this U.S in light of such a, uh, a very current issue. And the arguments of the, of the state have been taken into account, but there's no causes beyond the control of the state, like an earthquake or something, or natural disaster or something like that, that has taken place that would that would have made it impossible to respond. So yes, it's a, sh uh, a uh, the fact of the matter is is that the domestic affairs of states are not justification for not providing a, a response to international bodies. This is an important opportunity that is provided as well to the state to explain its policies, its actions, the measures it has taken to provide greater transparency in its action to its actions. And the the fact of the matter is there are serious reasons why civil society Society, that is the petitioners here, wish to to hear, to uh, learn, and for there to be greater dialogue between the two, etc. Among my concerns, though, they're pretty much in line with those put forth by Catalina Botero, the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression of the Commission, and as 
Uh, and as well as those put forward by uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, Felipe Gonzalez. It is legitimate, I say, for states to intercept communication of individuals to, 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 in the name of national security. This sur surveillance of, communi of communications is not is not being questioned here. What is being questioned is it cannot be an absolute power to do so, but rather it must be subject to restrictions, rules, procedures. We have received information from the information from the petitioners today, here and now, that both U.S. citizens in general, as well as foreigners are the targets of this of surveillance it is it is estimated that approximately a billion people not only heads of state and government are surveilled but also journalists human rights defenders as a matter of fact we've been told as well that even the UN, United Nations, is the target of, of surveillance. This is of concern to us because maybe the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights may eventually become the target as well of such, such surveillance. So along these lines of thinking, my question would be, what are the limits? The first question, that is, is whether there is actually such a broad, such broad leeway to be able to surveil some, such a, such a, a, a wide range of people, or are there limits? And if so, what are the, what are the restraints on that power? Are there, are, is there etiquette? Are there protocols? Are, are there procedures put in place? And, uh, that is by the NSA and to what extent are attempts made to uphold the right to ex free the right to freedom of expression privacy freedom of expression I'm interested in these ri rights all rights in democratic states have to be a balance must be struck between all of these, and so I want to know what are these limits, what are these protocols, what are these procedures, what are the rules, and what measures are being taken by the state to prevent possible or potential abuses that may have arisen in exercising these powers to surveil by the NSA. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner um, Escobar Hill. Can I ask the petitioners if you have some further comments or observations? Uh, we have a number of questions that we would like to put to the United States today, but we would also like to further additional uh, written questions for the United States to answer to the Commission um, within the next seven to ten days. Um, so, first of all, Mr. LaRue. Thank you. Tres Three very specific questions. The first one I'd like to ask in Spanish. The United States was always a m role model with regard to uh, freedom of expression, expression, the First Amendment, and all of the legal precedent that has developed uh, 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 with regard to this, and the access, access to public information law that has been developed is a sign of this as well. well. I do understand the concept that exists in the United States with regard to the Bill of Rights and how it is applied under the Constitution to all the to you all U, U.S. citizens. But my question is: Is has there been a question with regard to foreign policy and with regard to human rights and? is how to uh, discuss the universal nature of human rights, how to ensure, that is, that human rights are the minimal guarantees for any person anywhere in the, in the year without regard to their language, race, nationality, or any other characteristics. This has been a, a systematic concern of ours. La More a preoccupation 
um, if the system, if Commissioner Felipe Gonzalez read what the court itself had said, the, the special court, and if the system is so massive and moves so fast and has reached out so far, isn't there a breakdown in the judiciary controls? Isn't there a reduction of the role of the judiciary? Isn't there a risk of altering the checks and balances that have traditionally existed in the United States to defend democracy? And finally, the third question, which falls from the first one, is if, if this is a breakdown of judiciary control uh, and control of the public by access to information, as we have said, uh, isn't there a risk that a system goes out of control and turns against people in the U.S.? Um, monitoring political communications or campaigns or elections or breaching privacy. This was exactly the principle of what happened in the Watergate scandal. It was one president and one party monitoring the other. Uh, I, I think we must not think of those issues as issues of the past. We must think of them as issues that we must prevent uh, in the future from happening again, creating precisely the, the judiciary oversight and the, the parliamentary oversight that works, then that generates a certain degree of control over these mechanisms. If I could just offer three brief questions. First is that uh, in the government's public defense of these programs, they've overwhelmingly uh, pointed to domestic law and have argued that domestic law does not provide protections for foreigners when it comes to surveillance by the National Security Agency. But the government has never articulated its view of what constraints international law imposes upon the NSA. Uh, and surely it's not enough to say that foreigners are subject to surveillance when it comes to uh, international uh, human, uh, human rights law. The, the second question goes to what I view as one of the fundamental problems of the government's surveillance uh, in the last 10 years, which is that the scope is not limited uh, to concerns like terrorism or other uh, concerns that you would think would legitimately override uh, uh, expectations of privacy. Uh, it is much broader, and so I would urge the Commission to inquire as to the breadth of the NSA's understanding of its surveillance authority outside of the areas in which we might legitimately uh, expect government surveillance. And finally, there's been a fundamental shift in the way uh, surveillance has been collected in the United States. We've gone from a model of targeted surveillance to one of collecting everything at the beginning and running searches later on. Uh, and that shift will have dramatic consequences for privacy going forward, particularly if other countries embrace this model. And so I would urge the Commission to ask uh, the state whether that model of surveillance is necessary to accomplish the goals, uh, the often very targeted goals, of the intelligence agencies uh, in accomplishing their mission. Thank you. I will be very brief. Um, to follow up on Mr. LaRue's point um, about the, the uh, surveillance court, I would just identify also the, trans the lack of transparency of judicial decisions as, an as another sign of, of the breakdown of checks and balances um, and something that should be rectified. And in some ways we see the court even acknowledging that the lack of transparency in legal decisions is a significant problem and, la and prevents public oversight. Um, I would also be very interested in um, a response from the state about uh, the, pr the Schwane principles um, and uh, a review of the Schwane, a review of U.S. law, relevant U.S. law, um, in in line in or in light of the Schwane principles, um, the U.S. in uh, in response to uh, concerns that have been repeatedly voiced about the aggressive prosecution um, and indictments of national security whistleblowers has most recently relied on the October 2012 presidential directive on national security secrecy. Um, but as I've um, stated in, 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 um, in my introductory statement, there are significant limitations of that. And um, I, I would be interested in a response from the state about how uh, the presidential, uh, how there is sufficient protection for national security whistleblowers when the presidential directive does not provide for a legal remedy, um, allows any remedy that is decided by the um, administrative review mechanism to be only discretionarily applied um, by the, the um, intelligence agency. 
and it doesn't apply to contractors. So specifically, how would that apply to some of the specific um, national security whistleblower cases that have been identified in the United States for whom there would not be sufficient protection? Thank you very much, petitioners. Um, I'll offer the last word to the state. Um, we would welcome the written elaboration on the questions which we'll forward to the state along um, with some of those raised by the Special Rapporteur and a particular interest in the extent to which the United States, States is having regard to the international human rights principles which are emerging and evolving, including some of the very specific ones <coughs> which the petitioner has raised. But I offer you the last word. Just to uh, re reiterate our thanks to the Commission, the Commissioners, the Special Rapporteur, and the petitioners for the information and the questions and uh, to repeat our intention to respond uh, as promptly as possible to all the concerns raised. Thank you, petitioners, um, for the information which you have provided us. Um, we look forward to hearing more from you. And um, we will be following closely up with the United States for the written response to all the questions we have asked. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>